This is the view and the sound that we have woken up to this morning. I am officially in heaven. It's pretty lucky that we had to move rooms because the room that we're going to had to have its headboard restored. So, well, thank you to whoever the previous occupants were, I guess. Whilst Philip's in the shower, I've just set myself up to do a little bit of light editing this morning before we go out to a museum this afternoon. As this is going to be the only morning that we'll be waking up to this view, I am going to make the most of it. Look at the light coming in through those windows. I love Venetian architecture. The way the light from the water it somehow glimmers in a different way to in any other city. Spectacular. It takes my breath away. We're off to the most exciting day because today there is one of the boat regattas that happened during the carnival. So just in front of the church of Santa Maria di Salute, which you can see behind me, all of the boats are gathering and they're going to go straight past here along towards the Rialto Bridge. The hotel reserved this little table on the balcony for us. So we have the perfect view. And any minute now, the boats will start to make their way down the Grand Canal. You can't get a better front row seat than this. And I've even got my cup of tea with me. I can hear them all singing. There are people going out to join in and watch what's happening. The bridge is crowded with people. Philip is a hero who is bringing us breakfast on our little table. Very kind to say that. It's about to start. I'm very excited. Every pier is full of people. They're lining the edges of the canal to see the boats go past. But I like your thinking, cappuccino and a chocolate croissant. Philip's pretty excited by the giant rat boat. <laughs> it is great. I love the singing. More people going along to join in. I think maybe they left their homes a bit late today. Perhaps they'll just join in as the procession goes past. Oh, this is it. The oars are all up. They're ready to go. Yay, oars are going into the water. Oh, have you seen the cockerel, Philip? Spud takes to the waters. Never forgotten. The rat's getting closer. Yeah, the rat's easily the best. There's a giraffe on one of them. Oh, there's the fish, yes. Isn't it wonderful to see everyone in costumes like this? Oh, this is wonderful. Breakfast has morphed into lunch. I'm loving this. Today is superb. Overlooking all of the boats. And we've gained a friend. He's been with us for now most of breakfast and lunch. I think he's waiting for us to make one false move with the focaccia. Have you met Simon yet? <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I think it's Seymour. Oh, he just clarified. It was Simon first who went past, and now it's Seymour who's This is Seymour. It's his brother. We went to the supermarket, and so we've got olive focaccia, cheese, some artichokes cooked in spinach and garlic, bressaola, coarse white wine. Life is good. It's very good. And it's so sunny, even though apparently it's only four degrees. But in the lovely sun. in the sun, just yeah. sitting here reading, and also now you can see some of the boats rowing back. <laughs> We've it's been here so long. Distance. Oh yeah, they. Yeah. Oh yes, heading back to Santa Maria de la Salute. Well, that shows you just how long we've been sitting here. Reluctantly, it's time for us to leave the balcony and go and explore Venice. And I think a bit of culture is called for. We'll end up playing our favorite museum game, which is that in every room you have to choose a thing you would pay to have in your home and choose the thing you would pay not to have in your home. You're not allowed to think about any sort of financial interest. You can't think, oh, I'll have that because it'll go up in value. It's got to be purely aesthetic. Things you like or things you really dislike so much you'd pay not to have them. We've made it out and about, and there it is, that's where we're going. I'm very excited, but I would like to get some sandwiches first. Oh, I see it's food and then culture. Clever. I like your thinking. Um, we've come to one of our favourite sandwich shops. So I'm having this one crab stick one. I'm also having the salt card with radicchio. And Philip's gone for tuna and olives and tuna and artichoke. Sandwich then art. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.
the first room is dominated by an altarpiece by Veneziano. Veneziano was probably the foremost Venetian painter of the 1300s, and his work is spellbinding. It's usually against a background of just gold leaf, so the figures really stand out, but then there's this wonderful naturalism to the faces, and you just find yourself enraptured and staring at each of the characters, but especially the Virgin Mary in this wonderful altarpiece. And I love this art set against gilt backgrounds, somewhat stylized in the figures, but realistic in the faces. And it's been very hard for me to find something in this room that I wouldn't want to take home. But I think I found it. Maybe it's just me, but I'm finding them a bit creepy. Though I have to say, they're looking cheerful. Um, just, I'd rather not have it on my wall. Sorry. I actually quite like that one. I think it's quite funny. <laughs> you probably choose that one. <laughs> what I wouldn't take home is the 1950s refurbishment that I'm very proud of, because I keep talking about how innovative it was and that they took all the artworks off the wall, but now you can't see the room anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I <laughs> don't love these uprights was, anyway. They were saying that, oh yeah, and they chose a colour that would highlight uh, the paintings. But it was by a famous in. 50s architect, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Carlos Scarpa was famous for taking the paintings off the walls to display them. And there's a lot to be said for that because you can really get up close to the artwork and that is lovely. But I'm not convinced that the right colour was chosen behind the paintings. I think it washes them out. I think so too. I think it needs like, like a plum or something to have it pop. It's very tempting to say that that wonderful old piece would be the thing that I'd most like to take home from this room, but that's not it. It's the ceiling. The ceiling was made in the mid 1400s. This was a squalor, one of the fraternities in Venice, and it was done by Cozzi, and it's got hundreds of angels, and every single face is different. It's just a sea of seraphim as you look up. I think I'll take the ceiling home. The ceiling, love, floor, amazing. Also this, have you seen this? How detailed it is. Even when people are walking around, it jiggles a little bit, they see? The little oh, piece. yes. They move. And I love how clever it is. They, they put glass in the middle. So you've got him. <gasps> She's looking up at him. That, way you... that must be a rock crystal for that time, mustn't it? You can see her face on the other side. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to. As she's looking up to the cross. It's so delicately done. I think it's absolutely stunning. And there's St. George slaying the dragon behind it. Isn't that wonderful? I'm a little disappointed because the main reason I wanted to bring Philip here was to see the cycle on the life of St. Ursula by Carpaccio, which is in this series of rooms. It's just exquisite. They're meters and meters wide. And in fact, there's only one on display, this dream of St. Ursula. It's just wonderful it just draws you into this world in the 1400s look at that bedroom the detail can you see that beautiful candle the sconce with the mirror behind it so it reflect the light i can gaze at this for hours but we have the rest of the museum to see and sadly all of the others are not on display because the rooms that house them are being restored just means we'll have to come back next year this room is dominated by Veronese's Feast in the House of Levy. And I love the story behind this painting almost as much as the painting itself because, let's face it, that has to be one of the finest works of art ever made. This huge painting was destined to be the Last Supper in the refectory of a Dominican convent. So perfect as the monks would eat, they could contemplate the Last Supper. It seemed very fitting. But Veronese added many other people to the scene of the Last Supper. There are all sorts of dogs. There are soldiers. There are servants. There is a little person. There is even a servant with a nosebleed. And this was incredibly shocking at the time. So much so that Veronese was called by the Inquisition and a court case ensued. They asked him, who on earth do you think was at the Last Supper? And he said, well, just Christ and the apostles. But if there's more space on the canvas, I will fill it with whomever I please, because painters are allowed the same flights of fancy as poets and madmen. The Inquisition were not impressed, and they told him that he had three months to change the composition at his own expense. So he did something very, very clever instead. 
he changed the title of the painting. He said it was the feast at the house of Levy, the tax collector, who'd also invited many sinners to the feast, explaining why there were so many other random people around Christ and the apostles. By claiming that the Last Supper was a banquet, Veronese was able to leave his painting intact. And in this room, I'm absolutely torn because I don't know whether to choose this painting or another one by Veronese, The Annunciation, which is so strikingly original in its composition because the centre of the painting actually just leads you architecturally through this series of arches and the subject of the painting is relegated to each side with the Archangel Gabriel arriving in a flurry on the left and the Virgin Mary looking a little uncertain about the message on the right. Because of the unusual composition, it makes you feel that you're witnessing the scene as it's really happening, that you're just stepping into the room at the moment that the archangels arrived. And I think the moment before the Virgin hears the news itself, when she's just wondering, who on earth is this? And in this room, it's easy for me to choose the one that I wouldn't want back at home. And it's Tintoretto's Crucifixion. Undoubtedly magnificent, though this painting is, in its use of colour and its composition, I would never want to live looking at a scene of crucifixion in my home. And for any of you wondering why I like coming to Venice in winter, this is the reason. You just feel as though you have these extraordinary world-class galleries to yourself. We stayed so long, we were in there for hours, it's already and we've dark. only seen the first, not even... First all. half. I think it's also quite nice, you know, being able to digest what you've yeah, seen. You can't, if we did everything in one go, we exactly. wouldn't remember any of That's the paintings. I, mean. I think it's actually quite good that we are coming back. And now we're off to Philip's favourite restaurant for dinner. We've arrived super early, so we're the first ones in this room. Because our hotel needs just a little bit longer to get the room ready for us, so we thought we may as well have an early dinner. And then when we go back, I'll be able to show you the really historic bedroom that we're staying in which is one floor up from the one that we're in now and behind the Grand Canal so it doesn't have that beautiful view but it is quite interesting and we'll see the newly renovated headboard. I'm having ravioli with scampi and artichoke. As soon and as you mentioned that was special. Oh yeah, you knew yeah. I was going to go for it. Yeah. And you are having what you always have, the <laughs> yeah. ragu bolognese. A creature of habit. And it's delicious. Cheers. <laughs> My next dish is also special today. It's the turbot. It's a fillet. It looks good. Look at those olives and the caper. And you are having what you always have for your main course here. You stop saying that. It makes me laugh. The one I always have. <laughs> you are such a creature of habit. But it's lovely when you've reached perfection now. <laughs> it's retello tomato. This is such a pretty shop. I've walked past it a million times in Venice. It's the only florist that I ever see in Venice. And for the first time, I'm actually going to stop and get some flowers. We're just going to get a few tulips for the hotel room. We've got some yellow ones and some orangey ones. Are you happy? I'm so happy. I can't believe this first time I think I bought flowers for a hotel room. I think we have to ask if they have got a vase. Oh, good point. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> cut, cut a bottle of water in the middle. <laughs> you okay, I like your thinking. <laughs> I am so excited to show you this room. Now it's much smaller than the last one, but there are many reasons why I love this one. And the headboard is just one of them, the newly restored headboard, um, because it's not so much that, but we should just glance up and up and up and up at <laughs> the ceiling. Oh, I'm so excited to go to bed looking at that ceiling. I've set up the little tea station. I brought my mug all the way. This is uh, yeah, my hard drive because I'll be editing whilst I'm here. But look at this mirror. Oh, I love this place so much. I love it. Even though oh. I've been restored, I think. I've been restored all glass. Yeah. It, does, it blends in. It's so nice. The walls are covered in fabric and, well... We think we maybe needed a few more tulips because they gave us a really big vase. It was really sweet of them to give us a vase and our 10 tulips were a bit lost, but look at the mirror behind them. I think my favorite bit is the ceiling. I can't stop staring at the ceiling. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the parquet is lovely. Well, I haven't even shown that. The floor is lovely. And this door actually leads onto the restaurant, so we yes. can't use that door. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be coming in and out of this door, which by the way, is entirely lined in silk. It's wonderful. And I'm going to show you the bathroom as well, which is directly above the bathroom we were in last night. It is, yes. Because it's the stairs again. So through here, you can see that the uh, 
fabric on the walls is quite old. It's got real La Land vibe here, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Through here, we have a dressing room. I've just unpacked everything into there. And then a bath under the stairs. It's so romantic, I love it. And then here we look onto a little side street, which leads to the Grand Canal. You think this is the Lalande Venice? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Though, frankly, wish Lalande had those ceilings. And that headboard. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'll show you all what it's going to look like from lying down. Here we go. This is my side. I knew that was going to be your side. <laughs> You always know which I'm going to choose. Philip and I are quite an unusual couple because we don't have a set side of the bed. It depends where we are. So in London, we sleep the other way around to La Land, which means when we get to a hotel room, we're never too sure which way it's going to be in Philip. Always sure. choose. <laughs> <laughs> it says, this is my side, I think. You're a patient and long-suffering man. I'm not suffering at all. <laughs> I'm very happy. Well, it's time for my cup of tea before bed, and then we'll probably watch some interior decorating oh, shows on the laptop. That sounds good. I'll see you all again tomorrow, and until then, Adam. Man. <laughs> <laughs>